Hi, I'm Chris. I'm here with uh, my co-host, Danny Cork, and our producer and engineer, Lee Christofferson. Today, we're going to be looking back at Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways. And to you, there shall be many strange things. I've seen many strange things already. Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno. of time and perspective to revisit the films from two decades earlier. With the benefit of hindsight, a voting body of film industry professionals from around the world elects either new or previous nominees and hosts a live award ceremony designed to both honour and offer new perspective on the impact of this body of work on cinema itself and its influence on our culture. So 20 years ago, Lee, you, you saw it in the theatres, I assume? In the theatres, yes. Yeah. And uh, what did you think of it back then? Um, I thought it was terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. The art direction was the only thing I liked about it. Right. And Danny, your first memories of it? When I first saw it, I was maybe 11, 12. And I remember thinking, this might be a little above me. I don't really get it. And so I gave it a second chance, you know, when I was 21. And then I gave it another chance. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I was just underwhelmed at the time. I remember feeling like I I should be liking this, but I'm not. Right. It was kind of a feeling of sort of feeling... Uh, dramatically still hungry at the end. Yeah, of the film. yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I remember seeing the trailer for it, and I was just so excited to see to see the film because I thought the trailer just was kind of stunning. Yeah, and there was a lot of cool tie-ins when this came out. Um, the Annie Lennox song, um, and I remember even like. The was, McDonald's toys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that there was have been movie. the French fangs <laughs> inspired movie. by this, and the um, there was like comic book adaptations when it came out and um, I, I remember there was a lot of buzz around it. I actually went like to the first showing opening day. I, I was, probably did too. I was so excited about it and it was just kind of a letdown and I'm not sure why um, so I was pulling clips from it for the for the award ceremony this year and and scanning through it I suddenly was reminded of like how visually striking the film was and I was like you know this is pretty damn good looking movie I kind of want to watch it again and it totally sucked me just like the trailer did it whets your appetite you think there's got to be more to this what did I miss the first time right you know? and it, it's not what you missed it's what maybe the screenwriter and the yeah 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 missed. and well so uh, maybe we should do a quick recap of the story so and this is the first movie that's actually tried to put Dracula in its true sort of historical context with the character that inspired Dracula Vlad the Impaler right he's a great warrior in Turkey he goes out to fight this battle, and while he's gone, his love, who's played by Winona Ryder, is is misled to think that he died during battle. Somebody sends her a note, so she commits suicide. When he returns, he's so distraught that his love of his life has, has killed herself that he renounces God, takes his sword, stabs it into a, a concrete cross, which then it begins to bleed profusely all over the place, sort of reminiscent of the the blood coming out of the elevators in The Shining, and he renounces God, and thus Dracula is born. I think this uh, this sort of prologue is maybe one of the strongest parts of the whole movie. It is. It's a really melodramatic opening, and I think it really nicely sets the tone of the film, but then we move into this <laughs> weird story where, for some reason, 900 years later, he's buying property in London, and Keanu Reeves shows up at the store. Dracula invites him in. And the, the, the moment you meet the 900-year-old Dracula, I love that bit. Where you see, you where see he his... Where looks sh- like a golden girl? <laughs> wow. <laughs> you see his shadow moving across the castle walls, and then... And oh, and he's pan, got that... And we pan with him, and he's holding the... Really cool lantern. And everything about the Dracula's castle scenes, even at the beginning and the end, I think... Is, are amazing. They look so cool. But this, everything about this movie of, looks great. It does. It does. And this, but this problem of tone to me is that these scenes are very much played kind of like 
a little tongue in cheek. Uh, they're having a little more fun with it. Even Gary Oldman's performance, it's, you know, he's doing, they even have the children of the night line. Right. So it feels a lot like the Todd Browning Dracula mm-hmm. of the yeah. 30s. And his voice sounds, when he first hear it, it sounds like the can from Sesame Street. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Keanu, I mean, let's just, let's get it over with now. Keanu oh my God. He's throughout. wretched. Yeah. He's, well, the uh, actor said he had just come off. He even says his performance is embarrassing. He uh, he came off like doing five, six says movies, this? In a row, movies in a row, and he said he just had, just had nothing left. He does not suit the part of a young English well, gentleman in the 19th the century. No, yeah. he doesn't. He's part, part. Hawaiian. <clears throat> That's true. I'm, I'm all for blind casting, but come on. Yeah. So what happens is, is Dracula sees... Uh, portrait of Keanu's fiance who's played by Winona Ryder and she is the spitting image of his long lost love so he now decides I must go to England to be reacquainted with you know the reincarnation of of my former fiance I mean, this, so he this basically kidnaps up. Keanu's character I mean let's just talk about the reincarnation part is she a descendant is she a reincarnation because Anthony Hopkins is also he plays in the prologue as well. He plays this priest, and you right. don't know if he's... And you really barely good. see him, and it's only if you're paying attention that you actually spot him, I think. Right. And, this and it's is, a weird little, like, why did you... Well, and then also, he, he's the, sh- the ship captain narrating, Yeah, too. he's the ship captain. Right, Danny, you pointed that out really the other day. Confusing. Like, that didn't make any sense. They're yeah. trying to save money? Well, could you not find <laughs> another... It's like, it's like mon- Money Python's Bram Stoker's Just Dracula. Just hire another English narrator. In yeah. It. I'm sure that... Yeah. Sir right. Derek Hogan. Jacoby was free. Dracula seems to have the power to turn into all manner of beasts. Yeah. You're, you're not acquainted with his powers. This is kind of very new. I mean, I, we all know that vampires, you know, Dracula could turn into a bat. Now he's kind of like this wolf man. He's a giant bat. He was he's the a, wolf man too? Well, he, he was the, the wolf <laughs> rapist Confusing. thing in this. The and, wolf rapist thing. Yeah. Every time he I see He turns into mist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, every Rats. time I see that one, yeah. that one scene is, it's... The rape scene, I, I question, is that, now is that Dracula or is that one of Dracula's creatures? I don't, yeah. now I, think, I, I thought it was Jacob from Twilight. There's just these, like there's no rules that are set up. It's just right. like, shit happens, now shit happens. We need him to turn into a wolf, so he turns into a wolf. We need him to turn into mist, now he turns into mist. Right. Like even this, the scene where Keanu is in the castle, these vampire concubines, sirens, sirens come yeah. in, and they start to seduce him. And I think, like, my, at first I'm thinking, well, Dracula sent them in there to kind of seduce him and keep him occupied. And then Dracula comes in and, get away from him, he's mine! And it's like, wait, what? But then the next thing, Dracula's heading off to England, and then he's got the concubines. I'll leave the you know, Keanu back at home with the concubines. They'll keep him occupied. And it's like, well, what is it? Are they... Hands off, Keanu, or distract him. So you don't understand why, if he's weak, but he can still project this young vision of himself, why isn't he doing this back in Transylvania? Why is Right, this? right, right. It's just the rules of what Dracula is are not kind of explained. I mean, we're told yeah. he's 20 times more powerful than the average vampire, but we don't even know what the <laughs> what average vampire is. What is the average vampire, yeah. Well, and the, what they didn't explain in the movie that was in the book was why he bought those all those different houses in London, it was so he had time to rest during the day. So he'd have strategically placed resting spots See, all right. throughout the day. That well, makes see, sense. I, I, but, when, but, when why the, is he go, but why is he going to England? I never got why he was going to England until he saw one on or, or Nina's picture. Right. And so... So his, why would he buy up the stuff? Why would he yeah, buy yeah. up? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it might have just been a coincidence and he was just trying to get, you know, a new digs. I don't know. But right, like, right. A new 15 digs. I hear that London is quite but, nice in the summertime. <laughs> there was well, like, they had like, movies. He seemed like he really wanted to see them. Oh, yeah. okay. Now let's talk about that real quick. Well, I did like the bit with the wolf where he kind of can talk to the wolf and saves Winona Ryder from the wolf. You could come up with a better re- or a, a more interesting way for him to rescue Winona Ryder rather than Wolf Escapes Zoo. It's just <laughs> such an exotic problem. That didn't bother me as much as uh, the fact that like suddenly there's like a little homage to the history of cinema. Suddenly it felt like, hey, I'm a filmmaker and I want to pay tribute to the history of cinema in the middle of this vampire movie. Meanwhile, you're cutting back to... It just cuts to Keanu in in the castle, and he's jumping out of a window. And so, 
And I'm just, that's the moment. And unfortunately, he lives. <laughs> that's, right, that's, the moment, that's the moment I was like, oh, I really don't care because this guy may or may not be the hero. Or Either way, you don't, Is you just, you simply don't care. Hero? There's absolutely right. no tension. He's just escaping. So you've, all of the things you've set up with these, these three vampire women that are there to sort of guard him. We don't see how he eludes them. That whole angle is just, like, written off. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, he, and he escapes. Well, he's supposed yeah. to get back to, to save his love, who is being, you know, wooed by Dracula, but I didn't really get that he But it should be tough her. for him. It should be tough for him to escape. You know, it right. should be... It's not tough for anybody to do anything in this, this movie. It just exactly. suddenly... It just, it's, this, it's just happening. Dracula has now traveled from Transylvania to London to find Winona Ryder... And the first thing he does is he He's seduces slash rapes her best friend. Her Lucy. best friend. Yeah. And I was like, well, wait, what does she have to do with this? All I can think is like he needs her blood to become strong enough to become young, handsome Dracula. But, it but, but it's explained. never explained. That should have been explained. Yeah. Well, that no. makes sense if that was the case. That would be Right, exactly. Sense. Yeah. Why does he go after her best friend? Like, that's no way to get a chick. You had to have that character be bit and then have the Hopkins character come along and explain what a vampire was and all of right. this. Right. But it, it's but, so yeah. protracted and it's so... And she's just it, so annoying. She's Those very annoying. Those together were just annoying. It made yeah. you dislike Nina. The caliber of the acting was like watching the Mel Brooks spoof. Like, everybody was kind of... <laughs> Stuck right. In that, right, right, like, right, right, right. We're all caricatures. And yeah. Carrie Elwes is playing the Texan like, with a big knife. Right, right. right. Well, Billy Campbell it was like a, a Saturday I, Night Live. Skit. I totally agree, but it, like at some point, I think I kind of bought into all of that shit. All of her suitors, kind of like I found myself laughing along with the film a lot throughout. I happen to think Hopkins as Van Helsing is great in this. I think he's really funny when it just relaxes and. and has a sense of humor it's a better movie when it's played so stiff and theatrically um you don't believe it and so it's yeah. not scary you know, yeah it's, it's and that's my thing with oldman is i feel like he's kind of he sometimes he's playing it very tongue-in-cheek and then he's playing it very seriously and, and sympathetically which is a shame because i think this kind of brings us to our next point he that character starts to become more of the focus of the movie and the tragic element of that character, which was set up in the prologue, but then kind of goes nowhere. Goes nowhere, yeah, the yeah. Movie. And yeah. then you're like, oh, am I, am I supposed to be sympathizing with Dracula now? Because right. kind of do. Yeah. But if they had just decided, like, who is the protagonist of the story, that would have been a huge been help. helpful. Huge help. And I think Dracula would make an interesting protagonist because he is kind of a tragic figure. Mm -hmm. And even that, there's that moment where... He kind of is not sure if he's going to turn her into oh, a vampire that was a or not. Really strong moment. Right. Yeah. He was reluctant to yeah. turn her. Yeah. 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 And didn't want her to have that life. But it's yeah. too late in the movie. It's exactly. Too late in the movie yeah. Yeah. To start caring. Yeah. And it's also just filled with all of these extraneous things. I mean, Tom Waits, I think, does a good job as Renfield, but I'd love to know why Renfield's what? in the movie. Yeah. The way everybody in this movie kind of travels back and forth from Transylvania to England, it's like. It's with such ease they may as well be teleporting. It's done in seconds. That's something that would have yeah. taken you a very long time. Well, yeah. Especially when Dracula had to take the boat over with all of his dirt. It took months. Right. right. And it was right. a perilous voyage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, and especially at the end, when it's like a race to get, but who's going to get back to Transylvania at first? And it's just like this, we were traveling quickly as Dracula oh. was sailing. And it's just like, and then, oh, and then my do God. you love, he gets another power too, by the way. He gets telepathy. He can read. Oh, lines, right, 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 right. Going. He can another control thing. the weather. Right. Yeah. It would have been nice if all like of that had been set up. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so funny. If you just set that up from square one, we give it to you. The audience right. will say, you know, yeah. I grant yeah. you powers of a god, but you, he's so much more formidable that there's more tension to the fact that you know as the audience something that the characters don't, right. that this guy is reading her mind. You yeah. You've known and it's set up and you're expecting that, rather than Anthony Hopkins goes, oh, the vampire is reading her mind. It's like, <laughs> that's, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Scarecrow Video is one of the largest independent video stores in the country, located in Seattle's beautiful University District. One of the last remaining brick-and-mortar stores featuring DVDs, VHS, Laserdisc, and Blu-ray. If you can't find a movie at Scarecrow, it hasn't been filmed yet. For more info, visit scarecrowvideo.com. The Grand Illusion Theater, located in a converted dentist's office, the Grand Illusion is Seattle's classiest, weirdest, and completely volunteer-operated cinema, screening the world's finest art house foreign and revival films. 
located in the University District right across from the Jack in the Box. For more info, visit GrandDelusionCinema.org. Dr. Yeah? How did Lucy die? Was she in great pain? Yeah, she was in great pain. Then we cut off her head and drove a stick through her heart and burned it, and then she found peace. Doctor! All right, welcome back. Uh, let's, I guess, just do an assessment of, of, of the categories themselves. So, um, sound design, I really thought they did some great work. There's the thing that stands out for me is the moment where you actually meet Dracula and Keanu has walked into the castle, and there's all these, like, sounds kind of whispering... Behind, that are in played in reverse, you know, or played backwards, kind of like right behind uh-huh. Dracula as he introduces himself. And I, I thought it was nice and subtle. There's like it's not stuff that's over the top, but I, I don't know. I'm just a big fan of stuff like that. So yeah, I had no problem with the sound design. I thought it was fine. Nothing really stood out mm-hmm. to me at all about it. The sound in general, including the music, was so busy that I didn't really notice it. And I think it would have been nice to have moments that were built I mean with the exception of what you're talking about at the beginning of the film which I thought was a very fine use of it it's really you don't get a chance to notice it because the movie is so loud and busy you mm-hmm. know, I think otherwise oh think yeah 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 there was a yeah. lot of moments you mean the, you the whole movie in general yeah, is, yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. you could have had a, some quiet moments that would right. have benefited from yeah. from, uh, yeah. from great sound design but I felt like there wasn't really they weren't afforded much of an opportunity well yeah you're that. just kind of bombarded yeah, exactly. Time. Yeah. Uh, best makeup, which was done by uh, Greg Canham. Um, I thought the the different looks of Dracula, even though they were kind of like not very well explained logically in the script, I thought the different forms that he took were great. I just thought when I, when I first saw him as old, 900-year-old, he looked like an old woman. He looked a little bit Angela Lansbury-esque. <laughs> um, I just, I, I remember laughing. The creature makeup, I mean... It's one of those things where you're not quite sure. It's like, is that a prop? Is that makeup? When, right. it's, when special effects are done right, mm-hmm. you know, it should be blurring the lines. And sure. I thought when he was, you know, I, it, was it Gary Oldman in the you know, creature suit? I didn't know. Or right. bat suit? That stuff was amazing. It's somewhere between a costume and makeup. If I had any gripe with, with it is... Um, Keanu's hair. Hair. Oh, <laughs> right. hair so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That might it, be more. Oh, I, I was just going to say. It's on Keanu's head. <laughs> no, no, I disagree. I think, it is, I think it's awful because it's a bad choice. I think it's just like, because his hair slowly grays throughout the film, like just first a couple of streaks, and then it just looks like somebody dumped a bag of flour right, on his head. Right, exactly. So visual effects, I thought they were fantastic. I love the visual I, effects. I love the fact that everything was, was done old school. There's even a moment where they're driving the the carriage through Transylvania, and there's a lightning that flashes right. behind him, and it's, it's neon. It's basically it's a neon wire of lightning, and it's like stuff like that to me is just it's awesome. To me, this is the uh, part of the end of the golden era of special effects in movies, which I think you, you look at a film maybe what six years before Aliens. Everything is perfect in that movie, more, mm-hmm. almost. I mean, yeah. like today, it's still really yeah, 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 up. yeah. The effects are outstanding, and then. One year later, after Bram Stoker, you have Jurassic Park, which is when CGI really, I mean, I started seeing CGI was the great shortcut, and it has been ever since. And I think it's unfortunate, because I think this movie really shows just how creative uh, oh, yeah. and invisible yeah. your special effects can be. And it worked. It was telling an old story, mm-hmm. and I think it all worked yeah. really well. It looked um, good. There's a moment where Dracula's putting something on the bed, and then he turns, and he glides over to... To right. Keanu, and it's just such a simple oh, gag. He's crawling down the building. Oh, he's crawling down the building. And it's just, it's all just like, well, you just turn the camera on an angle and change right. perspective. Or the sets. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess Coppola fired all of his special effects people because they told him what he wanted couldn't be done without CG. Oh, so he fired him yeah. all and hired his son, Roman. Yeah. To run the department. And They're great. They were able to do, I think, all but one effect they were able to do in camera. Uh, best costume design by I. How do you say her name? Aiko Ishioka? I'm going to say, yeah, that's right. Sounds okay, good. we'll go with that. Um, if it's not right, get in touch. And, and yeah, let us know. <laughs> um, again, gorgeous. Beautiful. Like all did of. She did that win the Oscar, too? It for, did. I think it did win the yeah, Oscar. Yeah, this won three yeah. Oscars. It won yeah. uh, costume design, sound effects, editing, and best makeup. 
Yeah. Mm. And all of all of Dracula's costumes beautiful. Gorgeous. And 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 I tend to not like the stuff that's flashy, but this stuff doesn't feel flashy. It feels very appropriate, but it's still just visually stunning to look at. And, uh, and the dresses were gorgeous that yeah, all the women wore yeah. every time. Lucy's uh, white. Out, white outfit oh, that she's that buried great. in is just is, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, everything. Top notch, I thought. Uh, best art direction, Thomas Sanders. Sets, gorgeous, I thought. The sets were pretty, but I think the lighting was bad in some of it. Yeah. Because you just you can kind of just see, like, oh, there's a big, out, there's a big soundstage light. Yeah. I love the uh, the bookend Transylvania scenes. I love the design. I mean, even when you're sort of approaching that castle, it looks slightly it looks slightly um, not real. It looks well. The castle. That's what I liked about that's it. what's the cool castle about it. actually in silhouette looks like an old person hunched in a chair, but it worked totally worked mm-hmm. for me. So when the film is tongue in cheek, you kind of appreciate those moments more. They feel invisible because they seem suited to to what sure. the film is. But when it's taking itself very seriously sometimes that look that sort of deliberately theatrical look just looks stagey cinematography by michael ballhaus uh overall i really dug it ali i think you made a great point that there is there are moments in it that seem a little fakey and it's but it's mainly to me it felt like it was the stuff in the garden yeah i think it was one set in particular that yeah just didn't yeah fly. yeah but everything else I thought worked, especially the yeah, castle. The scenes in Old London I thought looked very cool. I like yeah. guess that's set direction. But it, yeah. Yeah. And the uh, likewise, there, you mentioned the, the shadows. Shadows were so cool. And there's another great bit. When, the first time we go to London and they're having the big party where Lucy meets, we meet all of her suitors. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, yeah, I guess it's Lucy and Mina's suitors. Um, but you see Dracula's shadow moving right. across the party and, and just. He's coming. Yeah, and there's all those moments like that I just thought were fantastic. So, uh, Best editing, uh, we got three people to credit there. Anne Groussard, Glenn Scandalberry, and Nicholas C. Smith. Uh, First movie ever to be edited nonlinear. See, that's uh, I didn't think that was the case, but all right, I'll take your word for it. According to uh, IMDb Trivia. Well, what do they Maybe know? Maybe the most major motion picture. It feels like so much of this movie was like, Cut out like all the like it feels like they just took all the logic and threw it away. I think that's screenplaying. I, I, yeah, it might be. It might be, but I'm not sure. But the editor doesn't get the final say over what stays and goes if they're taking out content. No, they don't. But so you can't really blame the editor. I mean, Coppola was probably right behind. Of course, him. of course. You know, I mean, I mean, he's he's ultimately the trigger man. I didn't notice anything glaringly bad about it. It, it seemed fine. Yeah, I mean, Except for a complete scenes it, that were missing. Yeah, but that's, that's not something I would <laughs> right, blame on an sure. editor. Yeah, but you never again. You never know. You never know. This is one of those things where it's like you never know. Best song, love song for a vampire by Annie Lennox over the closing credits. I'm sorry, I love this song. I think it totally works, despite all the flaws in the film. When that song comes on at the end, and they're both, or Dracula's dead. I felt sad. Well, watching the yeah, that's because I think the song knows more about what the movie's about right than the movie. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. It's like oh, but also I don't like like it's a good song. I love Annie Lennox. I've nothing bad to say about the song. I just don't like when a song is just used for the closing credits. I, I like totally a song agree that with is that. Used within the motion picture, and and I just think it's kind of a cop out when it's like oh, we'll just randomly we're going to put a hit song a, a on hit song on here. I totally agree. I totally agree. Here. And I and I think this is actually this it, is in, unless they use like, the music from the song in it, like in Titanic. My exactly. Will go on. Yeah. The instrumental. That's the score. That's the score. It, and exactly. Then she wrote words to it. This to me is one of the rare occasions. There's so many to me. This whole movie. There's so many exceptions for me. That, and I just want it to be good, and I really like that song. But I agree, it's it's t- it's tacked on. I think it's one of the few times a tacked on little song actually works. But best original score by Wojciech Kilar. I love this score it's too. Perfect. I love the score. It's totally over the top. It's totally melodramatic, and it fits. To me, it fits the tone of the piece. I I don't know. It's a really. I think it's a really strong score for for a, a horror genre. Danny, you. Uh, I think there are moments that are really good. Like, again, the prologue, it's yeah. really cool. Uh, there are moments throughout where it just feels like it's its kind of incidental and it's just amping up the volume. When the score has a th- sort of a, a motif that it's repeating, mm. I like it. But yeah. a lot of the times, it's it, those incidental 
you know bursts of yeah. you know bombast and so on are, mm-hmm. are really distracting and it's yeah. kind of it takes me out of it um so I, i'm gonna yeah i think i'm gonna uh, you're gonna piss on it okay uh best supporting actress sadie frost is lucy awful awful seriously the scene awful. with her and writer looking at the arabian nights books and giggling mm-hmm. oh embarrassing yeah uh best supporting actor anthony hopkins i think hopkins is easily the best thing in the movie or the best actor in the movie unfortunately that's not saying much yeah, I, I think he, everybody else suffers by comparison, but I don't think well, I could nominate him for this. He didn't really have enough to do. I think he's actually underused in the movie. I agree with that. I don't nicer. think he had much of a presence in the movie. Uh, I, think he, I think he does. He, yeah. when he comes in, I just, don't, I just don't feel like, you know, he really didn't have a lot to work with. He does have great touches, though. I love the bit when we first meet him and he's demonstrating the, the, the blood work and he has the vampire or the bat bite his finger. And then he, like licks it clean yeah. and you know it's just like little touches like that again I think he he's playing a guy that's in the moment he's not playing a guy in 18 right 78 or whatever best actress Winona Ryder we, we forgot best supporting actor Keanu Reeves we did best actress <laughs> Winona Ryder this was completely miscast she was terrible yeah well I've always had a crush on her but I agree she's pretty she's yeah. terrible yeah she also didn't really have she has much no, to work no, with either. No, it's she like doesn't. One minute she's, you know, the smitten ingenue, and then it's yeah. like you're in this... I will, s- I will say, like, when she kind of starts to, like, see Dracula as a potential suitor, I did feel like her performance kind of went up an- a little bit, but it's still not. It's not anything to write home about her, According do a podcast the- about. <laughs> uh, best actor, Gary Oldman as Dracula. I thought he was great. Uh-huh. I'm sorry. I, th- I thought. I thought. Like, I kind of think he dove in head first and and just kind of embraced what he was doing. I know you guys disagree. I like him as old Dracula. I think he's having fun there. But then I, I really like him as uh, kind of younger Dracula when he's uh, when he's reluctant to turn her. But they just feel like two entirely different movies. Mm-hmm. And I, maybe that's not his fault, but right. I simply, I mean, it's just too erratic. It's too up and down. I feel yeah. like I would like to have, you know, said that either was brilliant because they, they both were, but together right. they're right. not. Right. So. Sure. Also, I didn't, I didn't see any chemistry between him and Winona Ryder or Winona Ryder and Keanu Reeves on this. Yeah. Well, I will say that I, the I, movie I, relied on that relationship. Sure. Or bo- both of them, and I didn't believe she was interested in either of those men. Both Hopkins and Oldman, I think at least you could say they were of a higher caliber than. Oh, and, yeah. and 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 I felt but awful. Again, not saying much. I felt awful for those guys because here they are, kind of like acting their asses off in a in a good way, uh, and they're in a scene basically with a cardboard cutout, you know, and it's like they're still like kind of giving it their all, and what they're getting back is, you know. They might as well be playing tennis against somebody who's really just knocking the ball up against the wall. Best uh, adapted screenplay, James V. Hart. No. 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 I wish I'd said I'd read the book, but, you know, no. <laughs> no, I mean, regardless. You know, regardless. Maybe there was stuff in the screenplay that just got cut out that would have explained a lot more. It's possible. It is possible. Uh, best director, Francis Ford Coppola. I don't think he had any idea of the tone he wanted, and there are scenes that, when we were watching the movie, Lee said this felt like... Um, the, the the drama felt like it was in a high school play oh, and it, it so really bad. is and I'm sorry I blame the director for that I blame the director for poor casting with Keanu mm-hmm. I blame him right, for so writer. much but then he makes cool choices I mean all the visual choices are great the idea of I'm going to fire my special effects crew because they want to do it all CGI that's a brilliant courageous yeah. choice and right, to do then, that in and, any era but then but, he brings his son in and his son does it all but it's like so those maybe things that where, guy could be credited more Roman Coppola with how the look of the film than yeah well. but it's I mean it's, it's like decision as, yeah. the, as the, right. the yeah. sort of the captain of the ship to do that I think is great but Who's I'm by sorry Anthony all of those things <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> all of those things fall apart they mean nothing they carry so little weight when you don't believe an actor or you don't believe the script and that unfortunately I lay that at his feet yeah I, I, I do think this is one of the rare films that I can almost separate the picture from the director I would really like a lot of what he did and he deserves some kind of merit for that but I think he also needs to take as much blame for the the problems of the film absolutely yeah I mean one of the ways I always kind of try to judge 
a director is if I can watch the movie with the audio turned off and know what's going on. I couldn't tell what was going on, and I had the audio turned, turned on. on. So <laughs> He didn't direct his actors well. Yeah. Which is the most glaring thing problem with the movie is terrible terrible actors i'm not i'm not going to defend like the performances in the oh, okay. in the film but i do think like there is a point where you kind of have to go like well this person's never been good so i don't know why it's suddenly on this guy's shoulders to get a good performance i think, out that, of I think it's more on their shoulders because it's like well, why did you hire them you they've got a proven track record oh sure 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 know? sure but i mean i think it's like to again that's a that's a casting choice made from a marketing decision that's a bad that's not a way to make a movie I think you know alright best picture no nope the movie looked good it sounded good it just it wasn't a good movie I think I will probably nominate this thing for everything below the line yeah you know and everything above the line I think it's just gonna go except me I don't know Oldman I might throw in there but We'll see. Yeah, it didn't get any acting nominations. No, it didn't. Or, no. Yeah. Uh, has it stood the test of times? Well, uh, Rotten Tomatoes has, uh, has it at an 80%. You so mentioned that. I'm critics, shocked to hear that. I am too. Most critics liked this movie. Uh, Ebert gave it three out of four stars and said, I enjoyed the movie simply for the way it looked and felt. Production designers Dante Ferretti and Thomas Sanders have outdone themselves. Ebert did, however, voice criticisms over the film's narrative confusions and dead ends. Anybody who's never seen it, it's worth, I think, to take a look at it, knowing that you're going to be kind of bored, you're going to be confused by it, but they seem to be kind of having fun with it. And and so I kind of got caught up in it, in the just kind of... Like, oh, that's a really over-the-top moment. Ha <laughs> ha. Right. It made a worldwide gross of 200 and, well, nearly $216 million. So, yeah, it was the ninth highest grossing film of the year. I feel the same way I do today that I did 20 years ago, that I did 10 years ago. That it's, you wanted more. I wanted more. That's the thing. I, I think really that's, I think. I'm away going. I think it's disappointing because it should have been. Excellent. Exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. It, had yeah. the, it had the potential yeah. to be excellent. It's totally like you agree. went to a really expensive meal and it looked amazing and you just came out hungry. You know? Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. Was, eh. the, uh, the, yeah. The steak was well overdone. Right. <laughs> I think it stands up um, visually 20 years later and I think it's because they didn't use CG in it. I yeah. think CG would have really dated it. Yeah. It's fun watching it again. Uh, next month we'll be taking a look at uh, Lee's favorite movie, A Few Good Men. Not my favorite movie, but I, I did one of my movies. I really like that. Yeah, I can't handle that kind of truth. But if you are a movie lover and lo- want to support us, you can subscribe to us annually. Your annual subscription gets you into ten of our monthly for your consideration screenings here in Seattle, plus a ticket to our annual ceremony, which is uh, we now have a date, February sixteenth, and that'll be at the Fremont Abbey. And uh, you also get a lot of other perks, uh, over a hundred dollar value for only forty dollars to enroll. Uh, just visit twenty twenty awards dot org. And look for the subscriber link. We're an all-volunteer organization, so every little bit helps. And speaking of which, we'd like to thank our sponsors today. Scarecrow Video and um, Grand Illusion Cinema. Grand Illusion Cinema. If you'd like to sponsor an episode, just uh, contact us at the 2020 website. Our rates are very reasonable, and we're, we're pretty nice to talk to. So uh, You can follow us on Twitter at 2020 Awards or at uh, Facebook.com slash the 2020 Awards. Uh, and we post monthly contests where you can win free subscriptions and stuff like that. Uh, and we're also having a really great poster auction. Oh, they're beautiful posters they're beautiful they're posters. quite nice I have to say I'm very very thrilled with uh, we got 10 artists to come up with 10 recreations of posters from the from 1992 and we're going to be auctioning them uh, right before during and after the, the ceremony on the 16th so uh, once again you can find us at the 2020awards.org we have a list of all of our past winners and a bunch of other stuff there it's really fun to look at and uh, on behalf of my co-host Dan Cork and our producer Lee Christofferson here at Wonder Bread Studios thanks for listening and until next time remember it's never too late to start thinking about the past <laughs>